Okay, we're wow. live. Yeah, this is a big deal, Matt. I don't know if you know this. But this is my, my first performance <laughs> since uh, I got COVID. And yeah. I, I mean, it was a combination of I got COVID and I put on weight and I didn't want to be on camera for a while. I don't know which one is more accurate, but no, I had a, uh, yeah, back in November, uh, uh, right around Thanksgiving, I ended up contracting COVID, as did my wife. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, everyone asked the same question. Do you know how you got it? I was like, no, it's invisible. How do I know how I got it? Like, I would have run away from it if I knew it was coming. But anyway, I don't know how I got it. <laughs> but but yeah. uh, probably like in the city at something. But anyway, so I was out for two and a half weeks. I had pneumonia in both my lungs. Like I had one of the, I mean, I managed to avoid going to the, into the ICU because I sort of was thinking like, I really don't want to go in there. I have a aversion to the hospital. I sort of see like Hotel California, you know, check in, but so I'm not, I had my little, you know, two oscimeters on both fingers in case one was wrong and watching my oxygen levels. But anyway, wow. But yeah, but I came back like even with a, with a vengeance. Now I'm more aggressive than before. Sarah, wow. Sarah's like, I thought about it calmed you down. So I am so excited to be with everybody for another edition of the Manifestor Mindset. I missed you all. And uh, I just uh, want to make sure we do an office hour so I could just hear questions and we could just free associate, otherwise known as ramble. Uh, and then uh, hear what's been going on in your lives. But uh, as promised, I have an incredible guest today. Uh, he is the founder of a company called Omaze, uh, launched it in 2012 uh, with his co-founder, Ryan Cummings. And uh, he is a storyteller at heart, also a very sweet, wonderful human being. And his background, I'll let him tell it, was in telling stories on behalf of not-for-profits. And like I always say to people, um, you don't need to invent something in order to start your own business. You don't also need to have something be revolutionary. And a lot of times we raise the bar to what it think, what you think it takes to be successful. You actually need to have a proprietary insight, a little insight that is all your own that you probably garner through experience by being around something and sitting in something. And then you see, I see a better way to do something or I see a way to unlock value, a proprietary insight. And I would put uh, Matt in that category and he has created a phenomenal uh, uh, business uh, Disclosure, I'm an investor since almost day one. I was in the follow-on seed round, other one, otherwise known as a seed probably, but a friends and family than the, than the, uh, than the seed round yeah. pre-A. Uh, so I've watched this entire journey from the very beginning. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. How are you doing? I'm good, man. I'm excited to be here. I love what you're putting out in the world. Uh, thank you. It's, it's, yeah. uh, it's been fun it's, to see the evolution of Matt through this whole journey too. Yeah, well, you know, I always... Look, I'm always trying to change things up and and keep life interesting. And and COVID created an opportunity, frankly, to connect with more people because I was able to master my schedule. I play offense a lot more than I have ever done before in my life. So I don't have a commute. I'm not traveling three hours a day most of the time. And I can set my own my own calendar. And I still get up at 4:30, you know, and I still work all the time. But my work, frankly, is much more intentional than it's ever been before. And one of the things I want to do is communicate and connect, like. I just have a, I feel like I have a lot to share and it's, it feels good to share it. So, so I'm here. So let's give a little bit of the background before you launch Omaze. I want to help yeah. uh, explain the journey so people can relate to it. Yeah. So, um, you know, my co-founder Ryan and I, after college came down to LA to get into entertainment and our focus was on cause content. We had a passion for using storytelling to inspire action. And we did a bunch of different projects along those lines. We were the first directors on uh, the Live Earth concert, if you remember that. It was the biggest concert ever thrown. It was in seven continents in one night. And we had everybody from the Rolling Stones to Kanye. Um, we did a documentary series called Girl Rising about girls' education in the developing world. It was funded by Oprah, Queen Ronnie of Jordan, and Meryl Streep was the narrator. Um, we spent a couple of years traveling around the world, interviewing the world's greatest thinkers, a couple hundred Nobel Prize winners, and MacArthur Genius Grant recipients. Um, and then we did the uh, the Clinton Foundation's 10th anniversary global television concert event with everybody from Bono and Jay-Z to Bill Gates and Lady Gaga. And so we were doing that work, and then we, we, realized, we were working with these people that like authentically wanted to do good, and but we just realized we weren't doing that much good. Like we were creating a lot of awareness around these projects, but we weren't creating a lot of impact. And we saw that was kind of endemic to the cause content space as a whole. So decided to, uh, we need to figure out a better model to do. We were passionate about decided to go to business school and like surround ourselves with people smarter than us. And so I went to, I went to Wharton and I had never even opened Excel before I got there. I was a purely on the creative side. Um, 
And then when we were in school, we went to this event. I can, I don't know if you want me to keep up. I've been talking for a while. Do you want me to keep talking? No, about no, it? I enjoy it. No, we all, yeah. we're all taking it in. This yeah. is your yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm watching the call. If you see me, uh, my eyes go to the right, everybody. It's because I'm reading your amazing comments. So keep sure. the comments coming in. Keep the questions coming in. I'll make sure we have enough time to answer. I just want you to know why I kind of do this every once in a while. Yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, yeah, anyway, so we, when we were in school, we went to this event that Magic Johnson was hosting for the Boys and Girls Club, where he was auctioning off the chance to play basketball with him and go to a Lakers game. Um, but it was one of those things that was only available to the high net worth individuals sitting in the room. And we were in the room, but not high net worth individuals. We were like the guys who get invited last minute to fill the table. I'm sure you've been to a thousand of these rubber chicken dinners. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, my journey to sport, you know, started at the in the top, and then you know, has made its way down back down. But yes, I've been, I've had every kind of experience. Yes, yeah, exactly. So yeah. Yeah, you probably sourced them or were the experience. And so anyway, so we we sat there and we watched as the auction went up to fifteen thousand dollars, and Magic was our childhood hero. There's nothing, even to this day, that would rather do than play basketball with Magic, but we couldn't afford to participate. And so when we were driving home that night, we just said you know, that doesn't make any sense. Magic has fans around the world, not just in that room. And in fact, the people who can't afford to be in that room probably care a lot more about meeting him than those who can. And so if we made it available to everybody online for the chance to win, we could raise so much more money, so much more awareness, open up a whole new donor base. And that was eight years ago. Mm. So it starts off with a, the model, right? Creating great content around unique experiences and then uh, you're basically raffling off the, uh, the the chance to win that experience, right? And then proceeds going right. to charity, right? What was the what was the first breakthrough, uh, you know, experience that put you on the map? I know what my favorite is, but I won't say it. I'm just curious what your first breakthrough one was. Our breakthrough was actually Breaking Bad. Um, we had like we were basically we had like a month left of cash. We were like it was not the first year it did not work at all. And we were, we were, this is before, like right before we met you guys in the, in the scene, the, the first year just, just wasn't working. And we were almost, um, we were almost out of money and we had, we had the most we'd ever raised with one of these at that point was $18,000. Um, and that was not, that was not good. Our first experience did $750 to be on Cupcake Wars. Um, and really? then, wow, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, and then, um, and then this competitor came along and they raised um, 180,000 with their first. And we're like, that might as well have been a billion dollars to us. Like we just couldn't understand. It was 10 X what we had done. Um, and so we're like, wow, we got to figure this out. And we got Brian Cranston to do something around the finale of breaking bad. And then, um, and then we got a call that he had actually changed his mind and he was going to work with the competitor instead because they, he'd heard they're so much more effective and he was like, he was our only hope. He was our last chance to like, before we ran out of money. And so we called the woman we were friends with who like ran hit, you know, like helped manage his philanthropy. And we're like, like he, he's got to do it with us. She's like, I'm sorry. He just made a decision. And we're like, well, where is he? Like, where is he right now? And she's like, we have this charity event. And, and she, she told us what it was. And we went to the charity event and we snuck into the charity event and we walked up to Brian and we said, Hey, we're the guys from Amaze and we were going to do this thing together. Sorry, we haven't met. And, and but you know, we heard you're going to do it with our competitor now. And he's like, oh, it's nothing personal, but you know, these guys said they can raise a lot more. They said they can raise at least 150,000. And I said, well, we'll raise 200,000. And he said, what's the most that you ever raised? And we said, 18,000. <laughs> and he's like, well, how are you like, what? And we just said, look, we have no choice. Like our whole, like, we, everything we put into us is dependent on this. Like we will do everything. Like, you know what it's like, you've been there where like your career's on the line and you got to fight for it. Like we will fight for it. And so he ended up doing it with us. And then it ended up raising 300,000 hmm. and then introduced us to Aaron Paul. And we did the finale of breaking bad where you got to ride up in a Winnebago with Aaron and Brian and um, watch the last episode of breaking bad with the entire cast, Warren Buffett, all these people, uh, and that raised 1.7 million, and then that kind of set us on our way. Oh, I mean, first of all, that's an amazing story, and uh, just everyone out there listening. What I like about this story, there was a chapter in my life where I always wanted to prove people wrong. You know, when I was rejected, I actually felt like I was uncomfortable. You know, trying to not take 
no for an answer. Everyone always says that. It's very hard to be, to live that mindset. And I'd say the first chapter of my career, I was a sort of a chip, like, you'll see, you didn't back me and believe in me. That's kind of a useless emotion, right? <laughs> it's much better to make. So my partners actually really taught me about persistence and perseverance and how magical those little moments are, how those are trajectory changing moments when you actually fight for your dream. And so listen to that story. Like if you don't get him, you're probably done, right? I don't come along and I don't oh, remember. Yeah. The first check was a million dollars or something. I don't remember what we yeah. did, yeah. but uh, it changes your whole trajectory. That's it's like, are you, were you always that type of person who would refuse to take no? Um, I don't know if I always was, I think, I, I don't think I always was. No, I think, you know what? I, I, I I think the greatest fuel per, for persistence is the belief that you're serving something bigger than yourself. Mm. Um, you know, the greatest fuel for persistence is serving is service. And, and I just believe so deeply that Omaze could be something that the world needed, that there was, there was like this, and, and it wasn't like, I wasn't always just this giver or whatever. I was like ego driven very much before, but I just felt like when we came up with this idea, like, wow, there's something else we can like, this can serve. This, this is more than about us. This is bigger. And that like gave us the gave me the fuel just to fight through that and say like no like we're like there's really something here and no matter what it takes we're gonna make it happen, um, and there were so many times where that did not look like that was gonna be the case. I love that point. I think you're right, and I think what gets in the way of being willing to not take no for an hour that perseverance is probably either a combination of a little bit of imposter syndrome and maybe a little bit of the voice in your head saying like maybe they're right like that no might be validating something inside yourself, which is why I always say. Number one job you have that you cannot outsource to anybody else is to love yourself, right? If you to right. feel like you're born whole and you're right. And anything you can do to reconcile that sort of structural integrity where you have belief in yourself, belief in the idea, conviction that you're serving a higher purpose, this thing must exist. Then you are willing to not take no for an answer because there's yeah. a purity to it. Like, no, you're actually wrong. I mean, you don't want to be delusional and make sure if the no's begin to accumulate, maybe they're trying to tell you something. But I love that story. My favorite thing that got me doing is the... Uh, the Schwarzenegger. Can you tell the Schwarzenegger oh, yeah. story? So everybody out there, when I'm done with this, I need you to go ahead and uh, make sure you, you go check out the uh, the uh, Schwarzenegger take video. But why, why don't you tell the story? Yeah, we had, um, so after Breaking Bad, we started to get some notice and then we got a call from um, this guy who, this guy named um, Daniel Ketchell, who was his chief of staff and his governor. And uh, he said, hey, Arnold wants to do something. Can you come over right now? <laughs> and so I was like, <laughs> I was like, and so we went over there into his office, which is um, amazing. It's like the size, it's, it's like half a football field, this office. And it's got like Terminator statues and a jet, like literally like a fighter jet hanging from the ceiling. And, and like, just it's just crazy, everything you want it to be. And we get there and um, we're talking. He's like, you know, what do you think Arnold could do? And I was like, well, you know, trying to understand. And I look to the left and there's this picture of Arnold standing next to a tank. He's got like his, his elbow in a tank. And I said, what's up with the tank? And whose tank is that? And he said, that's Arnold's tank. And I said, Arnold has a tank? He's like, yeah, Arnold has a tank. I was like, oh. So <laughs> I, would not have, I mean, thank you. I would have been finding out like there's no Santa Claus when you're yeah, fine. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And he uses it too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, and it was his tank that he drove in the Austrian army when he was 18 years old. No. Uh, and he got it through like relationships with Colin Powell, basically. Like he'd gotten a hold of it. and. And I was like, well, where is that thing? And he said, it's 45 minutes away. And I said, can we offer a chance to ride in the tank with him? And he's like, yeah, no problem. And I was like, well, there's our, there's our experience. And then the funny thing is we only made this video about what it would be like to ride in a tank with Arnold Schwarzenegger and crush things. And so it showed all the different things that you would crush. We made a joke about it. And he's really obviously very funny in it. Everything from like a car to a copy of Million Dollar Baby because it makes him cry or, you know, like just we made this whole video and it, and it kind of blew up and went viral. Um, but when we were filming it, he, you know, we had told him, all right, we just need you to film for the first half hour and then we'll have someone else drive the tank because it was going to be a full day shoot. And so I text the guy after we get like the establishing shot of Arnold, I text the guy in the tank and say, all right, you know, we're good. Arnold can, uh, Arnold can be done now. And he writes back, he says, Arnold says he likes crushing things. <laughs> we just ended up staying for the whole day, just driving around crushing things. <laughs> How, and what does that generate? That, that, yeah. oh, that. How much I raised? It raised yeah. like 1.6 million. 1.6 million. For which charity was it? After School All-Stars, which he founded. So great.
So yeah. you know what's interesting. So pause there for a second. Just to, now reconstructing your reconstructing your proprietary insight, right? It's about there's an inefficiency at these auctions between premium items and the fact that they're not generating enough eyeballs, right? And so there that creates an arbitrage on behalf of the buyer, but it hurts the charity and it's a waste for the one who's donating the item. And for years and years and years and years, and is actually still how it goes. On my wall are incredible pictures of the entire cast of the Goodfellas, and uh, you know that and uh, Pulp Fiction that I got at the last minute of an auction uh, at the Super Bowl. That it was just my my wife Sarah's like, why are you spending thousands of dollars on these? But I was like, because they should be going for thousands of them. I'm going to go ahead and resell them on behalf of Autism Speaks or something like that. You know, I'm going to take advantage of this arbitrage. So it still exists. But so that's proprietary insight number one. But then two. You then say uh, the the object of the exercise is to bring eyeballs to these ex to these experiences to these items, right? If you didn't have the marketing expertise, the storytelling expertise, I'm not sure the manifestation would have been enough, right? They just throw some items on eBay or something. Talk to us a little bit about those components, right, and how you knew that that, that part would work. Yeah, I mean, we we you know we're storytellers at heart. That's how humans make sense of the world right so we we knew that impulse and we also what we also believed was that laughter is the shortest distance between two people and um you know there's a huge roi in laughter that's underestimated when people build companies um you don't need high production value for laughter you just need some creativity and like and and you have a stronger emotional connection from laughter than any other emotion right and you, even sex like you feel a bond to people when you laugh together and so so we always looked for funny ways to communicate what we were doing, even though we're in a space that was historically pretty serious with charity. Um, and so we knew that if we could create fun videos, and that's what we pitched Brian on, like we'll create some funny videos that we'll get out and spread. And we consistently did that, whether it's Arnold riding in a tank um, or Matt Damon and Ben Affleck arguing over who you'd rather meet when you when you know when you win their experience and like making fun of each other. We just kept doing these um, these really funny videos, and they they kept spreading. You know, and we I mean we did over three billion video views in the first couple of years, um, and that's what really got it to go out because we had low we didn't have much money for production. Um, we didn't like we weren't able to do it, and, and so that's what kind of started to put us on the map because we we understood the power of storytelling. So Matt, so Matt, things are things are going great, right? You you raise money, you now know this is not going to fail, right? You're now and you're about year six. Uh, what, what was year six looking like in terms of revenue or, or success? Um, year so I think by year six we were think we were doing we were doing well. We were still going. We were like at twenty million in revenue, probably mm -hmm. at that point. Um, you know, like that's to us, not to what we were raising. We, we have right. Doing right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We had raised, we had raised over, we had uh, raised over a hundred million dollars for charities, um, and and you know, so we were we were we were going along at a at a good pace, not an amazing pace, but a good pace. So tell us about probably the most important experience of your life. Uh, take us into that day. Um, yeah, so I, you know, I basically clinically died. Um, what happened was when I was born, my stomach was twisted and a knot and I was supposed to die when I was born. And they did this surgery and the scar tissue from that surgery broke off all these years later um, and created a bowel obstruction, which I didn't know at the time. I just knew my stomach hurt. So I called my buddy who's a doctor and explained the situation said, I have, I'm hosting a dinner night. I just want to make sure like, I don't even go to the hospital. He's like, you should go to the hospital. It might be that your appendix is bursting. So I go to the hospital, um, I'm in this pretty intense pain. They can't figure what, out what is going on. Our COO comes, because I was supposed to meet her at the time. Her name is Helen and my parents come. They do all these tests and they say to Helen and my parents, look, we can't figure it out. We're gonna keep him overnight. You guys go home. And if he's not better in the morning, we'll do surgery then. So then Helen drives home to her house. It's about 11 o'clock at night at this point, And she pulls into her driveway and something is telling her that she needs to go back to the hospital and helen is british and a coo and very serious she's not like a venice listen to the cosmos type person so like this was like very out of character for her but the voice was undeniable so she drove back and if she hadn't driven back i would have died 45 minutes later because mm -hmm. the blood pressure had plummeted the machines had not alerted the nurses 
Um, and I was just fading away. And so she got there. She had been in the hospital with her grandmother. And so she kind of knew how to read the machines. And she went and got a, a doctor and said, look, this looks really bad. And the doctor took one look, called in a crash team. They rushed me down into surgery. I came out of surgery and they said to my mom, they said, the good news is we figured out what it is. It's a bowel obstruction. The bad news is, is that his heart rate is continuing to plummet. We don't know why. And he's in critical condition. Hmm. And then a couple hours pass. My mom goes downstairs to get my dad and my brother. And then she comes back upstairs and she hears over the loudspeaker code blue in room 437. And my mom works in a hospital. So she knows that means flatline and she knows that's my room. Mm. So she rushes up to the door and she gets there and the nurse says, I'm sorry, you can't come in. This is really serious. My mom said, look, I was there when he came into this world. Mm. If he's in this world right now, I'm going to be in that room. So she let her in the room um, and they were doing the, I was flatlined. They were doing the, the uh, compressions and they were doing the electric paddles and my body was bouncing up and down. And, you know, my mom started to crumble. It's, it's one thing to lose a child. It's another thing to be three feet away when it's happening. Um, and at the same time, my dad was outside with my brother and this doctor came out and said to another doctor in front of my brother, not knowing it was my brother, hey, we lost this guy, he's gone. So my brother pushed my dad in the room and said, you need to be with mom. And so my dad kind of came in from this side and my mom was faced this way towards me. Me and my, my dad was cr crying so loudly that my mom turned to him to say, like, Gary, you got to be quieter. They're going to kick us out of this room. And, you know, my dad was kind of like, if I can't cry right now, like, when can, when can I cry? Um, but she said when she turned to my, to, to my dad, she said she saw something she'd never seen before in a mm -hmm. hospital. She said every nurse and every staff member and every doctor in the ICU had just gravitated outside the window. Mm -hmm. um, and like 40 of them and they look like this silent church choir just sending in positive energy and she was so moved by these people that were sending love to this person that they didn't even know um it just it was this kind of transformational experience for her it just filled her up with strength mm. and and she took a deep breath and she turned to me and she started coaching me and she just said matthew david polson these people are fighting to save your life they're fighting so hard to bring you back, but you're not fighting hard enough. You need to show them that you're a fighter. You need to fight to come back. And they said it was this surreal experience because here's this 65 year old mom who's in this room that she's not supposed to be in. There's never anyone in this room except for the doctors. And, and, but, but, you know, she kept fighting and, and the flat line went on for four and a half minutes, which is, you know, a long time, usually you use brain activity after 20 seconds. And so, um, but they don't usually fight that long, but because she kept fighting, they kept fighting. Um, but at one point, you know, she started to think to herself, this has gone on too long. And she just, just couldn't believe what was happening. She's like, I, I just can't believe I'm going to lose him. And if I lose him, I'm probably going to lose my husband too. And, you know, so her mind went there and right as she got there, the doctor kind of shook his head as if to say like, this is, this is over. Um, and, and he started to walk away and she, and she grabbed him and she said, no, please like, don't like, don't call it yet. And as she did that, he turned back and said, wait a second, I think we have a pulse. And then all of a sudden, like everyone kind of stopped. And then I just, my eyes just opened up hmm. and I popped up. And I remember like looking at my mom and looking at my dad and seeing everyone in this room, just like, you know, cause people don't usually pop up from a flat line. I was on my right side and I kind of like slowly lifted my right hand and went like that. That is crazy. I mean, I know everybody listening right now. So I just need to take a, take a breath. I mean, yeah. all the people right now in hospitals too, are dealing with grief and trying to pray for their loved ones to get out of it. You give a lot of people hope. Somebody just made that comment and they're completely right. Um, so, whew. All right, let's shake that off for a second. <laughs> so tell me about, you know, Matt Pre and Matt Post flatlining, who you were before that, who you are after that, so we can all glean, you know, the learnings from that incredible experience. Yeah. Um, you know, it's taken me a while to figure that out. People expect you just 
have that and then all of a sudden you change your day. I know when I went through cancer, it's like it didn't it doesn't automatically change you. You need to work on letting it change you. You yeah. wanted it to change you, but it's not automatic. I mean I didn't come as close as you did, but you know, I know what you're talking about. But yeah. uh you know, I um what I believe is possible um is fundamentally change and your your potential to influence that um has fundamentally changed. Um you know, I had like a come back to the light experience. Like I was on the other side. I remember it vividly. Um, and if you would have said, am I a person who believes in a greater consciousness or chance to transcend these things before I would have like, I would have argued against those possibilities. I would even, even after it happened to me, I looked for re scientific reasons why that didn't really happen to me. Um, but when you, when you do the research and you listen to what people are studying and you know, like I remember like trying to fight back to light. I remember being able to hear my mom. I remember feeling this sense of total connection with everything on the other side. And so I believe that now um, that there's information and collective intelligence out there that we can tap into if we just allow that possibility. And I know that maybe sound like that sounds woo woo or crazy, but um, you know, I think that manifests is optimism. I think it manifests as a frequency as a mindset that like that I used to think optimism was a, was just like you're either an optimist or a pessimist. It's just like a personality trait. And like now I believe it's a skill, you know, that is honed in adversity, just like a warrior hones her craft in combat. That like that you can practice that and that and that it's not about believing things are just gonna work out. It's about knowing where you want to go and recognizing all the obstacles between you and that place and then starting to figure out how do you how do you overcome those. I mean it's it's the title of your of your show, you yeah. know, um, but I, but I believe that is a superpower. Hmm. Um, do you so think that, can you, can you trace in your business and in your life ways in which it altered the trajectory of success and realizing yeah, your fun, Yeah. Fun, I mean, I mean, it did, that experience changed our business dramatically. Um, mm -hmm. Like after that happened, I came back, you know, I mean, I was, I was gone for two months, you know, like they, even after they brought me back there, there's two more days where they, they said I had 0% chance of survival. I was in the ICU for 10 days. Like I was, I was totally disconnected. Um, you know, and I'm sure the people watching are entrepreneurs. They know what it's like to be like heads down 24 seven for six years. It's all you're thinking about. And then you go away for two months. And I wasn't even allowed to talk on the phone to people at Omaze. Um, and when I came back, I was really struggling to be back. Um, and because while we were doing well, I felt like the trajectory we are on with the talent, um, there was a limit to how big those could be because we didn't control our own destiny. And and I really, I talked to our CFO and I was like, I'm not sure that I should still be the CEO because I haven't figured out a way for us to be really scale. And I, and I now realize how short our time is hmm. and I want to feel like we're making the most of it. And I don't think we are. Um, and, and she, you know, and then we, so I was literally thinking about like what, who else it could be. Um, and then six months before I left, we'd done this campaign with Daniel Craig, where you got to go to New York, you got to go to the Aston Martin track, you got to ride around in a one of a kind Aston Martin, and then you got to keep the Aston Martin. Um, and it was supposed to raise 300,000 and it raised 2.1 million. And halfway through our marketing team was really smart. And they said, what if there's no, Daniel Craig, what if it's just the car and that also performed well? So then we decided we were going to take a leap and buy a $250,000 McLaren and offer it with just Omay's distribution. Um, and that launched. And then we said, you know, if we could raise 500,000 on our own, then we'd have something. And that, so that coincidentally launched the day before I unexpectedly went into the hospital. And so then when I came back, I was sitting out with our CFO, Nina, and we were talking about, I was sharing like my fear about, being here and whether I was could make the most of it and our mutual desire to do more with our time. And then I said, by the way, whatever happened with uh, McLaren, did it raise the 500,000? And she said it raised 1.9 million. Hmm. I was like, oh, wow, that changes everything. And so then three weeks later, we announced to the team that we were going to go from doing 300 celebrity experiences to 50, that we, we had a merchandise business. We cut that, a brand business, we cut that. So we're all going all in on what we call Omaze own, which is the McLaren or a Sprinter van or race your student debt, stuff that we totally controlled. 
Um, and, you know, and that's transformed the business. And like, we're, we're on a trajectory now that is fundamentally changing in terms of, you know, what we can do in the world. And we now our desires to be the first company to give a billion dollars to charity. Um, but to the, when we announced that new direction, we got a lot of opposition from our team, from our board, from our advisors. Um, and I think the, having gone through, I don't know if I would have had the strength to resist that if I hadn't gone through what I did. Um, because I, I, I was so, I was so ego driven before that experience, not in a way that I think I was like a egotistical jerk, but that like, I cared so much about what other people thought. And I compared myself to people all the time. And that created this fear. Um, and, when I had the experience of just fe feeling that oneness and recognizing what really mattered and how much of those, th those fears I had just were just these consequences that I had created in my own mind that weren't real. Um, that helped me resist the people resisting the new vision. Cause I felt it. And I was like, I don't care what, you know, I can overcome that. I believe it. I see it on the other side. And so, you know, I think it helps you be a better friend to yourself, you know, be the one to support you in those difficult situations. I love this topic. I talk about this topic. You did such a great job articulating it. I, a lot of times I think back to when I was at Sloan Kettering and I want to tap in, back into that experience, not because yeah. I want to deal with the fear of, of, of dying. I want to deal with the awareness of mortality and harness it because I experienced what you experienced, which is when juxtaposed against the prospect of death, the things you think about don't really matter that much, not in yeah. a fatalistic way, in a liberating way too. And there's a lot of power in being cognizant of your own death and not being afraid of it because you realize, all right, I'm here. It's precious. The stuff, the condemnation, the judgment, the voice in your head, the imposter syndrome, it all fades away when you realize eventually you will join the universe, right? In some much bigger way. And it is so powerful. I have an app on my phone called We Croak. My children think I'm absolutely crazy. But it chimes in five times a day uh, to remind me that I'm dying with an incredible philosophical message. And like, it interrupts the cycle of of caring about stuff that just does not matter. And Amazing. I'm like, oh, right, we are mere mortals here, and that's beautiful because we all are sitting the same stream, and we all return back, you know, to the universe at some point. So, like, you can remain a really driven, hyper competitive person who's vested in in what you're doing while being aware of your own mortality and harness the power of being cog I think it's the one topic we don't talk about enough. Why, I think, who said, Socrates said, the one thing we're most afraid of might be the best thing that ever happened. Like, yeah. some version of that. So one topic we don't talk about in a way that's powerful and it's probably the thing that's that's messing us up the most because we're so afraid of it as opposed to saying like, it's okay. Like we're all, it's a yeah. shared experience, it's gonna be all right. So I love hearing your attitude. Like everybody think about that. He's attributing his ability to go all in and resist all these issues that just don't matter that have changed your trajectory of a maze. I'm going to stop talking for a second. So many people have so many questions and I don't want to monopolize you. Why don't we go ahead and, uh, and Heather on my team was amazing, curates this show. They missed you too, Heather, even though they can't see you, but they know your incredible work because I'm all over the place. Uh, thanks to your support. Let's ask some questions, throw them up. Can you see that, Matt? How long did it take for you to decide on what business model would work for you? I mean, within like- Amazing. Within yeah. Yeah, well, we, well, the model became um, of like a sweepstakes for people entering for the chance to win something and us taking a percentage of that. We're a for profit company. Um, that was an instantaneous when the um, when the Magic Johnson moment happened. But in terms of like iteration on how that's structured and how we worked with our partners and how they do that, that's been a constantly evolving. You know, um, it's, it's it's get a little bit better every day. And so, um, you know, I continues to evolve even today in terms of how we expand into it. So I, I think you can, you know, you're always tweaking that. That's a great point. We talk about, you know, it's funny, the thing I invested in is not the thing I have right now. And the right. thing I have right now will not be the thing that ultimately one day exits potentially. Yeah. It's amazing that the thing that separates people from success and failure is not the execution of the vision. It's the refinement of the vision. Actually, if you actually execute the vision you put, you put forth, I guarantee you will be, you will be unsuccessful. So it's not rigidity, rigid adherence to the vision, it's the willingness to adapt it. And I believe that you get uh, endless opportunities right up into the precipice of your own destruction to go ahead and course correct. It really is true. I guarantee you that every time in your personal life, professional life, you will be given one last lifesaver to say, if you would just make this course correction, you'll be successful. It's ego and insecurity 
that actually gets in the way of making that course correction. So that's, yeah. well, maybe that's you know, like the, like, uh, it's just the way that you, that you talked about that, like, you know, you got to allow little things to die every single day, right? Like the old mm -hmm. way to like, let that die be reborn. Right. You, 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 I, I think that. you realize that like, is you said it really beautifully is like the, the, you know, death is our greatest fear. I think one of the things we realize is nothing, nothing is as bad as the fear of it. Right. Like our, our capacity to, to, you know, I fear death. That was the greatest thing that ever happened in my life. Hmm. Um, and so, you know, and then, and then that, that sounds maybe a lot to wrap our head around, but like the reminder every day that like these things are just constantly evolving and changing. And if you just let those things go, you will find something better and, you know, is, is powerful. And it, it can be bigger, more philosophical things, or it can be letting go of the way that you did something yesterday. This is a great question. I don't know. I'm going to butcher your name. Uh, Kolofalo, if you could actually comment too and let me know where you're from with that incredible name. And uh, how do you think this skill can be honed without having to go through a near death experience? That is true. We don't, not all of yeah, us yeah. you went through. You don't need to go through a near death experience. I recommend not going through a near death experience. Um, yeah, I mean, it's this is really. I think what we're talking about is a growth mindset, right? Mm -hmm. And so the, you know, the growth mindset, it the skill can be honed in a couple different ways. One is it's just figuring out like how do you get past fear, right? In order to have the growth mindset, you gotta you gotta overcome fear. And there's a bunch of different techniques that we can do to do that. Taking breath is a really powerful technique. I do it a hundred times a day if I'm on a call or I've been something that's giving me anxiety or makes me start to think about all the things that could go wrong you know just a deep a slow deep breath into your belly like and actually for those who are interested is uh, in a parasympathetic nervous system there's a lot of science yeah. actually about how it's entirely yeah. incompatible to have anxiety with a deep breath that stresses your diaphragm so even if you don't believe in anything buddhism or any other way to get there believe yeah. in science and uh, and your uh, your ner ner uh, your your uh, your nerves to, to figure out how to get there. Great book out now called Breathe by James Nestor, which mm -hmm. talks about this. And it's we've lost connection to the breath on the West. And but if you look back over time, like there's all this like scientific evidence. So it's not, but yeah. yeah. Right. To harness. Thank you, uh, Kalevala from South yeah. Africa. Thank you for giving the world Elon Musk and for letting us borrow him for a while so we can claim him as our Thomas Edison. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, actually, I want to throw up a question from uh, David Beck. I'll start sort of reading it as uh, Heather puts it up here, but Really great question. You know, positivity is infectious, but uh, do you have to consciously balance it with the realities of certain business decisions? Curious how you manage this. It's interesting, right? So there's another P word that is bad in the same genre, and that's called being Pollyannish. But it's po positivity does not being Pollyannish. Pollyannish means being delusionally uh, believing everything is going to work out to the extent to which you bury your head in the sand, right? Positivity means believing in the power of you to harness a positive outcome in all situations, because also what, what other choice do you have? And Pollyannish means that you blindly think everything's gonna work out without intervention, right? So positivity can still enable you to make very hard, to, I make some of the toughest decisions, but I'm positive while doing it, that that decision is going to lead to a better place, right? As opposed to, you know, the uh, pessimism ne and negativity weighing down your decisions. I'm curious what you think about that, Matt. I agree. You know, I think uh, it's, we, we we have our one of our virtues um we we use virtues rather than values i don't mean it's because values are what you believe in virtues are what you do and it doesn't matter what you believe it matters what you do so we have our core virtues is envision the outcome you want and work your way back and so when you you know where you want to go then you have to like identify all the obstacles that are in the way and be really clear about how difficult those obstacles are to overcome. So positivity is just the belief that you will find solutions to those obstacles, not the belief that those obstacles don't exist because they do. Mm. And so that's what helps you, you know, and so we're like, like, we're constantly, you know, the Bushido warriors talked about having death on your shoulder. You're constantly looking for what can, can hurt you. And we're like, we're, we're very active about talking about bad news in the company so that we can identify. So we're clear about those obstacles because you, you can't overcome them if you don't identify them. Why don't we take uh, two more questions if you have a few more minutes? Yeah. Uh, who do we got in there, Heather? Oh, well, this is a good question. Let's talk a little bit about that because you're in you're in a rare intersection, right? You're harnessing the power of content and items to raise money on behalf of charity, then taking obviously a percentage. So you're you're a for profit business, but harnessing uh, these market dynamics to generate a lot more money for 
not-for-profits. So what about not-for-profits who want to either access you know, your infrastructure and be part of the OMA system, or they're out there on their own and they and they don't have access to it? Yeah, well, for those who want to access OMAs, you can email me, Matt at OMAs, and I can put you in touch with the team about how we do that. So happy to do that. Um, in, you know, in terms of, obviously, I would need to know what, what it is that your nonprofit is in order to advise specifically, but I would generally, I would say, focus on the store, your story, like really connect people to what it is you're doing through the story and, and connect people in a way where they are your, where the, your donor is the hero and not you. I think a lot of brands and a lot of nonprofits make the mistake if they make themselves the hero in the journey and you got to make your donor or your customer the hero recognizing like how, you know, that you're the guide to help them create a better life for other people and focus on the po the possibility versus just the alleviating of the bad, right? Too many nonprofits talk about like, this person's life will be a little less bad if you do this. But instead, like, how do you like, how how is uh, helping a homeless charity not just gonna make someone's life less comfortable, but you're gonna help them achieve their dream of getting off the streets, providing their children with a better life, focus on that um, in the narrative, and then a lot will come from that. I think too, I, I love that advice, you know, and I'm on the board of a couple of things, including Autism Speaks, I've been on the board for seven years, and I think one of the hardest things for not-for-profits to do is to, on the one hand, your your mission and mandate is to, is to help people, right, in whatever area that you're working in, right? But that doesn't mean you shouldn't borrow the principles from business in pursuit of that mission, right? So it, it's very tough. Without the profit motive, I find certain things fall away that are, would actually really be beneficial to not-for-profit. And most importantly is storytelling, right? Like, uh, you, know, you know, I'm very close to autism in my life. I care very passionately about it, but I'm also self-aware that, that uh, there are a lot of issues that are competing for people's time and attention. And by the way, people's first priority is to feed themselves and their family. And you can't fault them for that. So just because you feel like it's so compelling to you, just recognize that it's not, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. And so as a real, how do you break through? You break through through storytelling and making people care and connect with the underlying problem that you're solving. So I think not-for-profits dramatically underinvest because they see marketing and communications as like a luxury and a nice to have, and they're a little bit insecure that they're bored, you know, or they won't get that perfect score because too much admin is being spent. I think that not-for-profit, the number one thing if you're involved with a not-for-profit is give them the ability to, to invest in a sophisticated marketing function because where they where you have an advantage actually over the random run-of-the-mill corporation capitalist empire is that, you know, especially this generation would love to work for a, a not-for-profit, but they also demand a certain level of excellence and sophistication. So you have your pick of incredible storytellers and marketers out there, but usually the money's not there and usually the will is not there to give them a you know, free hand. That's right. Beautifully said. Um, so let's do uh, let's do one more for uh, Heather. If you got one, you want to you want to put up. No, oh, that's interesting. What is the last thing you do before going to sleep? Not go to sleep would be my answer. What about you? <laughs> um, I uh, I share gratitude. I just say you know I'm I'll say the three things I'm grat grateful for that happened that day, and even if it's something that went it was hard. I'd reframe it as like, I'm glad for the lesson that I learned from this thing, not going how we wanted. Um, you know, I go to top spot. I'm just like, I feel like I'm playing with house money, you know, because mm. I went through that, but I think all of us are, you know, you don't have to go through that to feel that gratitude. And so, you know, it's, you know, it's funny about it. That could sound like an empty platitude, but it's actually technically correct today. You like you, I always say, you know what, the numerator is not the denominator, right? Like you don't know how many total days you've been allotted. You just don't know, you know, how many ta how many ta days you've expended. Yeah. So that's kind of a fascinating thought. You know, today is just as likely to be, maybe not actuarially, but just as likely to be the last day as tomorrow is. And so you are playing where the house is money. And that should liberate you to just not care about yeah. things you shouldn't be caring about, which is pretty re pretty remarkable. And I, I, I would encourage anyone out there just listening, like, Try to change your relationship with mortality and harness it to make you live better and happier. Um, maybe that's the moral. This is probably why we're on here right now, Matt, because your story is re is really remarkable. You know, we're on that just to, and maybe that's why you're here is to communicate that message and bring some relief to people. Uh, in addition to a billion dollars that you're going to generate, <laughs> what are uh, three? What are give us uh, the coolest thing on Omaze right now that we should while we get off here we go spend some money on a on a raffle? What's the coolest thing we can get? Um. We have uh, we have a there's two that I really love. One we have a we have a, a penthouse in London in Chelsea, a three million pound 
penthouse can get the whole house furnished, all taxes taken care of, all um, everything. It's like you just walk in into your house. Um, so that's pretty that's pretty cool. Mm. Uh, and then we have this restore. I, I love VW uh, buses. They oh. just like they're synonymous with um, with adventure. Yeah. Um, so we have this VW bus with a with a Tesla engine in it. So it's restored with a Tesla engine that uh, that Willie Nelson is helping us uh, spread the word about. No uh, way. Yeah, and that's a uh, and that's you know yeah, what, you know what sorry, yeah. is that or a uh, what's it called a jet streamer whatever those silver things are those are the Airstream. what is it Airstream. Yeah. Airstream rather that Airstream or that VW probably heard two beta two biggest requests for presents so but. Yeah. Uh, Anyway, yeah. I'm really proud of you. I mean, I don't know what the end journey. I know the, there'll be some fantastical, crazy exit on your horizon. And I know at that point, you probably won't care about money because now you're completely enlightened. But it is amazing to watch you persevere through the years. You've like you've done something extraordinary. You are you are ending an unfair arbitrage on the universe and delivering back hundreds of millions of dollars to not-for-profits. The more successful you are, the more awareness the, the, your model has the more you can end that arbitrage that exists that nobody really wants to exist. You don't want to buy an item at an auction that really should be going a lot more. And you're really undermining the amount of revenue that could be going to some great not-for-profit. The, the world wants you to get this right. So that's what a great business. The bigger you are, the better things get. And then you know, you'll know you create generational wealth for your family and for your employees. So I'm rooting for Omaze, right? I've been there all along, you know, and, and uh, you know, we love you and we're just so proud of you. So keep on going. No, thank you, man. I'm very grateful for you, man, for you helping us get here. We wouldn't be here without your guys' support along the way. And for what you're doing now, this is so cool. Um, yeah, I'm having a lot of fun. And, and, and hope. So yeah. thank you. Right. Thank, everybody, thank you for turning in. We got a lot of people turning in who sort of really just lives got better by your story. So we're going to be back with more Manifestor Science uh, sessions and trying to find those people who not only have an incredible vision, but have the ability to go ahead and manifest. You heard some great lessons from Matt, the fact that, you know, he was on the brink of the whole business going under if he had just let, you know, my favorite character, you know, the, the uh, teacher from Breaking Bad, Branson, go ahead and, and kill your business, but you fought back. And and every business, there's a story like that. A colleague of mine today, my first, when I, I was the first investor in June Oven, I have a post uh, right now about how his almost business had run out of money many times and we had to fight back. Every business has that story. So anybody out there who is feeling slightly perse uh, persecuted or just feel like it's a reflection of them that they have to fight to keep their business from the brink of extinction, know that that's part of the journey and just uh, power through it because on the other side uh, are fantastic rewards that give your life much more autonomy than you ever could have dreamed. So just you know, stay with the fight. And uh, thanks again. Thanks again, Matt. Thank you, Matt. All right, be back soon. Thank you.